Hello, and welcome to the C programming part of EELE 101. Okay, so the, the question is, um, what's going to be in this course? And, and there are some overriding questions that you may have, so we will cover this in this overview. And the first question is, you know, what's the difference between computer engineering and computer science? So we'll um, answer that question. And then you notice that it's a focus on C programming. So the question is, why are we using the C programming language? And then I'll give you an overview of how the uh, semester will unfold. OK, so if we look at a computer system here, we can see at the bottom there's hardware. And then typically on a computer system, there's an operating system. Then there's programs running on top of the operating system. And then there's a user interacting with a particular application. Okay, So computer science uh, typically is focused at the higher level abstraction. So we can see that you know, we're uh, moving... Uh, um, up the abstraction level. So we, we can think of the hardware is a lower level, that's the details, the circuits, and we're moving up. So a computer scientist um, is thinking about, you know, what theoretically can be done. So, you know, you can almost get into science fiction and things like HAL, of, you know, what could you imagine computers doing? Um, computer engineering um, is focused, uh, you know, down more in the details, closer to the hardware, and it's at the levels of decreasing level of abstraction. So the questions here would be, you know, what can practically be done? You know, how can we build computers that are faster? Uh, you know, consume less power so they last longer um, in your pocket, you know, without having to recharge the battery. Okay, so um, so computer science typically concerns itself with you know, programming languages, um, you know, data structures, uh, software engineering. You know, how do you build you know big software projects? Computer engineering, on the other hand, is down at the circuit level. You know, the electronics, digital logic, um, you know, microprocessors digital signal processing, embedded systems. And actually, the embedded systems is, you know, one of the things that we focus on in the uh, computer engineering department, and we'll cover what those are a little bit later. Um, and, and so computer engineering uh, typically is at the lower-level abstractions. It deals with hardware. Um, but you'll find that there's actually... A, on the software side, a bit of overlap between the two. Now, in uh, the electrical and computer engineering uh, department at uh, Montana State University, we use a number of languages um, in the department. So if we start at the very lowest level language, um, these are what are called um, hardware description languages. OK, so down here, um, this actually describes uh, electronic circuits, the digital circuits that you can uh, create. And there's a couple languages, VHDL and Verilog. Uh, you know, we tend to focus on the language called VHDL. So the HDL is hardware description language. Okay. And the V is an acronym um, that describes that as well. Okay. So um, machine. So then, if we go up, we can start dealing with machine languages. Um, so the hardware description languages you're dealing with clocks and actually what's happening when the, the uh, digital circuits you know, make transitions. Okay, so that's that's really low level because you have to deal with timing closure and things like that. Okay, so then if you go up a level of, of abstraction, um, you will be targeting a particular uh, CPU or microprocessor or microcontroller. Um, we have in the past uh, targeted um, 
the 68HC908, but things are changing and we are actually making the transition to a Freescale um, ARM-based uh, processor. So that's actually what's um, running the, the race car, um, and that's what's on the Freedom Board, as we'll explain later. Okay, but machine languages are still very low level. I mean, here you have to know the, the codes, you know, the ones and zeros of what a CPU do. So you'd actually need to know the code that will make that particular CPU do an add or a multiply or move um, data from memory um, to the to a register. Okay, so that, that can get extremely tedious, so nobody actually um, wants to you know, use machine languages. So uh, we go up to a, what is called an assembly language. Okay, so now you can start using, you know, keywords like move, okay, or add, or multiply, okay, instead of remembering all the ones and zeros. Okay, so this is actually the lowest level that, you know, people use to program in, you know, in, in terms of programming a CPU. Okay, but but it's very specific to the CPU that you're doing, so it's a lot better than you know, the ones and zero of a machine language. Okay, so then um, we have what are known as procedural languages, and the, in the department we use C and MATLAB. So C is can be known as a portable assembly language, and MATLAB is a higher level um, scripting language that's great for plotting and digital signal processing. Okay, and then you can see as you go up the abstraction, you know, so here's, you know, where computer science comes in, and they typically teach their intro programming language, you know, and this is now Java, which is an object-oriented um, programming language. Okay, so our um, department which is computer engineering, tends to focus on all these lower level um, languages. Okay, so now the next question is, um, what's an embedded system? Okay, well an embedded system is a, a complete computer system that's um, buried in a larger system. Okay, so it's um, a small computer that has dedicated functionality. Okay, so think of your car and in new cars here, you know, typically when it's cold out, um, you don't have to choke it anymore. You just turn the key and it starts, right? Well, there's a lot of different parameters such as temperature, okay, how much fuel is, you know, entering the engine, the timing, all of that needs to be controlled. So there are dedicated computers nowadays that um, make the engine run optimally for you. You don't have to worry about it, okay? If you're in the military, okay, you know, you want a plane that can, you know, fly, almost fly itself. In fact, there are planes that fly itself, and they've actually had some that can actually land on an aircraft carrier itself, okay? So microcontrollers and microprocessors are the brains of the embedded systems, but they actually have to interact um, with the electronics around them. So they're actually... You have to, you know, connect it up to part of the system that it's controlling. Okay, so they're found everywhere. Again, we are mentioning cars, um, but since they're cheap, you can actually put them in for a number of different uh, places in the car. And in fact, the BMW 7 Series is uh, said to have 70 microcontrollers on board, you know, from controlling the engine to controlling temperature, to remembering where you left your seat, so you can just push a button and it, everything gets configured to you as you left it last time, okay? So microcontrollers are the computers you don't see. They're cheap, okay? And there are a lot of them, okay? So back in 2010, there were 14 billion microcontrollers sold. And in a few years, that is practically projected to double. Okay, So, you know, you're used to your microwave oven that you just push a button and it heats food for a minute. Okay, So that has a microcontroller in there that controls the 
time and power that's that's being put into your food okay and the reason there are a lot of them is they're cheap okay so the average uh, selling price okay is about a dollar okay and this and this projection is tending to flatten out so they think it's just going to level out the average price of a dollar so you can get cheaper ones and there are more expensive ones depending on you know what you want in them okay but the market is continually to grow okay so what that means is as a computer engineer um, there are going to be more and more opportunities uh, where uh, you need to put uh, and bury computers okay now we will address the question as to why C is a programming uh, language, okay? Since uh, there are a lot of languages out there, okay? Um, if you go to Wikipedia and just look at the list of programming languages, there's uh, over 600, almost 700 languages listed, okay? Why are, you know, what's with these languages? Why are there so many of them? <clears throat> well, it turns out that uh, if you're doing something in computers, you want to automate it for what you're doing. And so when you're writing or using a language, sometimes for the particular application, you say, okay, I wish the language had this feature in there. Okay. And nowadays, it's actually relatively easy to create your own language. Okay. So people do that. Okay. And they create languages um, for what they're working on okay so it's really reflective of the activity that's happening um, out in the computing world why there's so many different languages okay so we or we'll focus on on C uh, as we'll see for the uh, following reasons one is it's actually one of the most popular programming languages out there so if you go to this uh, Toby Programming Index, okay, it's, it's just an indicator of sort of the popularity of the programming language. So each month they do a search of, you know, like, you know, 100 different languages and just sort of create a ranking of that. So it's not like the best language, right, or the most lines of code. It's just sort of a popularity um, index of what's out, out there. But it's actually interesting to see that C ranks um, close to the top, you know, and it, it's actually bouncing around. So it's either Java or C, you know, and it's, since it's a, sort of a noisy me measure, okay, um, sometimes C is the most popular, sometimes Java is the most popular, okay. But it is one of the most popular programming languages, okay. Now, for embedded systems, these are the... <clears throat> you know, systems that you're um, burying in systems, C is the most popular language. And, and as we'll see, there's a, some reasons for this. Okay, and then if you look at uh, Java, actually Java's not as popular as C, and then this, this is old information, but more current information shows C even becoming more, more popular as the language of choice for embedded systems. Okay, so why does C dominate programming languages in embedded systems? Okay, the number one reason, okay, is performance. Okay, C is at the right level of abstraction where um, it's not too painful Okay, to get programs working, uh, and because of that, you get performance. Okay, it it's it's the right level abstraction, meaning it's it works well as a model of a CPU for the microcontroller. Another reason is uh, compilers are free. There's actually very wide support for this language. Okay, code size is smaller. Okay, this is important for microcontrollers that don't have a lot of memory on board. Okay, less overhead. Well, this is actually part of the performance um, because, um, you know, since there is less overhead, the, the, it does run the programs faster. 
Okay, and then if you are actually wanting to get people to work on your embedded systems, so if you're a company and you're trying to hire people, okay, um, there's already a lot of people that know, know C. So for hiring concerns and get, getting people that actually have the skills you want, um, C is also a good choice. Okay, so now let's look at how this semester will, will unfold. The C programming um, effort is going to be divided into roughly three five-week segments. Okay, the first five weeks is going to be introduction to the C programming language itself. Then we'll use C to target the embedded board that comes with your race car. And then ultimately we need to look at how we can use C to control um, the, the race car. <clears throat> Okay, so looking at the introduction to C part, okay, we will actually be using a C interpreter called CH from Soft Integration. And this is actually a superset of C, okay, which it, there's some nice features in there for, for instance, plotting that a normal C compiler doesn't have, um, which will be useful for us. Um, all the uh, computer labs in the department will have CH on them. Okay, however, you can go to this link here, okay, and download your own free version, which is the student version. And uh, it's for this uh, course, it's actually highly recommended that you have your own laptop that you can download on, so you can actually work on your programs in your dorm room rather than having to come to the, the computer lab in the department, okay. And also, um, since some of these files that, um, or the programs for, for the student versions, and also the, we'll see later for CodeWare, can be rather large files, and we're talking, um, you know, a gigabyte or more, um, the computers in the department will have this software already on them, so you could just bring in a flash drive and just copy the um, programs and then install them rather than having to download it, but the, the download link is available here for you to use. Okay, so when you open the CH um, um, interpreter, which is the CH uh, IDE or Integrated Design Environment, okay, you will <coughs> go over here and it, actually there'll, there'll be a number of tabs, so you can see that you know, if you click on this hello.c tab, you will have some programs all ready to try out and run. Okay, associated with this CH interpreter, there's actually a textbook um, by the author who has, you know, developed this interpreter. It also has a book. Um, since we are just using this for the first five weeks, we're not requiring the, the book um, as a text for the course. However, if you're interested in, in it, uh, th this is the link to the, to the book, but it's not required for the course. Okay, so we'll be using this for the first five weeks to do an intro to C. And the next five weeks, we will actually target the, the, uh, um, the embedded board that comes with your race car. Okay, so this is the Freescale Freedom Development Platform. It's a very small board that just has a um, ARM um, processor on board. It's actually a very cheap board, so you can actually go to a distribu uh, distributor and buy this board for $13. So once you learn how to use it, if you have any other projects that you want to um, have a computer attached to, uh, you can buy another one uh, fairly cheaply. Okay, so um, in the uh, embedded and actually in the smartphone phone computing, um, ARM, the ARM processors have become very popular. So Freescale has just uh, essentially taken or licensed this core and dropped it in, and now they've added all the um, um, microcontroller um, peripherals that you would expect to have if you needed to connect up to a... Uh, the outside world and develop a, a complete embedded system. Okay, to program this board, we will be using 
Freescale's Code Warrior. Okay, so this is a development environment that Freescale has that targets their microcontrollers. Okay, we will be using this. Um, there are free um, versions, okay, the special edition, okay, so you can actually uh, go and download this. Um, however, this is a very large program. You know, this can be, you know, a, uh, like 1.2 gigabytes, so we will have these programs available on the computer and lab that you can just copy to your flash drive and then copy over to your laptop and install it. Okay, so then uh, you'll use C to control your race car. Okay, this is what the race car uh, uh, looks like. Ours will look slightly different, but it gives you the same idea. Um, the, the goal is to um, race it on a track, okay, and to be the fastest on the track, okay. And there's a black line on a white background, so you have a linear array camera that's going to find where the black line is, and then your onboard uh, microcontroller has to determine where the black line is in that array and control the steering angle um, to keep it on the line and control the speed of the car so it doesn't go too fast and fly off the track. Okay, so the task that you have to do is to you know, see the black line, you have to control steering, you have to control speed. So you want to be slow enough to stay on the track, but you want to be fast enough to win the race. Okay, so what you need to do each week for the C programming part is, one, watch the online lectures like you're doing now with this one. Um, you'll need to take a quiz at the, on the D2L site after you watch the um, online material. There will be a C programming exercise assigned, so you'll want to um, start working on that and then go to the recitation section to demo it. So you'll want to work it, on it ahead of time. So if you are if you got it, you just show up to the recitation section and demo it and you're done. However, if you're stuck and need help, that's the time to get help. Okay. So you'll demonstrate your program during the recitation section and then at the end, you are going to upload your code to the D2L Dropbox. Okay. And again, it's highly rec recommended that you have your own laptop, and this is mainly for your own uh, uh, convenience. All right, and just just kind of a you know quick quick view of where we are in in sort of the history of things. Okay, computers have not been with us very long. Okay. So, you know, you can get back here where we, the beginning of written history where people, you know, first started writing, you know, a stick in the mud or in clay to record something, okay? And only 67 years ago, we had the first electronic computer, the ENIAC, okay? So this was made up of vacuum tubes, okay? We don't have really have those anymore because everything's been replaced by transistor, transistors, it weighed 30 tons. It took up 1,800 square feet of floor space. You know, this is like the size of a house. You know, you know a typical, you know, house that you would live in. It consumed 150 kilowatts of power. All right, this is the same power of, you know, more than a thousand desktop uh, computers running. And it was slower. This is you know, only. 0 0.05 MIPS. I mean, this is slower than a, a cheap pocket calculator that you can buy nowadays, right? You know, so this is kind of the start of it. And now you can carry, you know, your smartphone nowadays has, you know, more computing power than this that you can carry in your pocket, okay? So we've gone from you know, writing and recording things with, you know, stick in the mud to nowadays you can have a flash drive that stores 64 gigabytes of information and you can keep this in the pocket. In fact, you could, you know, keep 10 of these in your pocket. So you can almost have a terabyte of information that you can walk around with. Okay. So what will the future bring? Okay. In, in terms of society, we've only gotten started with computers. 
So the question for you then is how are you going to shape the future? So as a computer engineering, uh, as a computer engineer, um, what what are you going to do with it? Okay, so there's actually a lot of different things that we can apply computers to um, that are just getting started. You know, for instance, the field of chemistry and biochemistry, uh, genetics, uh, um, proteomics. You know, these all require uh, computers to keep track of the vast amount of information that is that, that is being um, recorded. But you know that's that's just one out of many 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 things that you can apply uh, computers to. So the question is, what will you do, and how will you change the future? So good luck on that endeavor, and uh, uh, have fun racing a race car. Or there can be other app, um, app. You know, if you're not into racing, we can do other things with the race car as well. So good luck.